Welcome to Travels with My Friend. It is one of my favourite episodes of this series. Again, it's sponsored by Babbel, and let me tell you why I'm so excited about what I'm doing on Babbel at the moment. Down here is one of my favourite views in the whole of my house that I share with my wife, Camilla. Campunches, the magical one of this mansion. And I'll tell you why it's my favourite and why it links to Babel. This whole house is full of incredible wall paintings and decorations and tiles. And it's this pattern I really, really love because it's kind of got that Egyptian look. And someone said to me and came to see the house, they said, the Egyptian look, obviously it's massive in Art Deco and Art Nouveau, but particularly in Viennese Art Nouveau, which is called Jugendstil. And that is why I am learning a little bit of German. So I've got my map, I'm on Babbel. It's one of the top language learning apps in the world scientifically proven to help you start to learn a language within just three weeks, which is pretty impressive. And I've got a deadline to go for here, so that's good. Now, it's designed by real life teachers using real life scenarios. So I'm trying to think of a real life scenario. <laughs> and I thought, I'm British, yeah? So what do I want to do when I talk? I want to talk about the weather incessantly. What's great is that it helps you with your pronunciation. Now, I've always been quite worried about German. I, I went down the French route at school. German always seemed pretty difficult to translate. So the fact it speaks back to you is really useful. Let me have a go in German. Es regnet den ganzen Tag. Es regnet den ganzen Tag. It liked it. It's been raining the whole day. Es schneit. It's snowing. I'm getting a lot of green lights here. I think I might be a natural at pronouncing German. You never know, it could be a hidden talent. I think I might learn a little bit more than the weather, but I think it's a great place to start. It's really intuitive and great fun, and I highly recommend Babbel. There is a 60% money off offer if you click on the link on the screen and also in the description below. And what is fabulous is that there is a 20 day money back guarantee. So basically there's nothing to lose. Give it a go, it's a lot of fun. Well, we're off to Lisbon, and it's only going to take us about an hour to get there. And we're checking into a very, very different place to stay tonight. <laughs> Should I be worried? I know that you're more into palaces. You're used to palaces. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I can't believe I'm doing this to you. All right, come on, luggage, we've got to go. I figured that we couldn't come to Portugal and not stay by the water at some point, so this is our accommodation for the night. Oliver? Are you in there? So what do you think, Ollie? It's pretty cool, but you have to come and find me because I'm a bit stressed I'm up here. I'm going to find you. Did you go up? Oh, no. I didn't know this was up here. Sorry, I'm being stressed at the moment. Oh, that, this is you being stressed? Sorry, should I not film you whilst you're so oh, no, very, no. very stressed? I don't want to harsh people's vibes. Oh, it's a tough life, isn't it? You do know we've got a city to visit. Oh, defo. Should we give people a quick tour? Well, that'll take about 30 seconds. Yes, let's do that. So this is the, the grand roof turret. We've got a lawn we can, you know, lounge around on. Also play a bit of croquet. <laughs> A true Brit abroad. Uh, mini croquet would be perfect up here because it's a very flat roof. <laughs> Can't get up. Are <laughs> you having some problems? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's absolutely fine. This is your sun lounger. That's mine. Good. This is your shower. Uh, we can maybe shoot, have a water fight with the other boats. <laughs> this is the staircase. You have to be quite careful here. But of course, I was in the Navy Reserve, so I know exactly what I'm doing. No one's terrified. I'm not... <laughs> reaching for this whilst I... Uh, I can see our boat's got a motor on it. I don't know if we can actually drive it. I don't think L so. Let's not go anywhere. I'm coming down. Good. It's not easy to compete with all of the palaces we've been staying in, but you have to admit, I didn't do badly. Yeah, it's cool. I've got the best bed this time. You do. It was only fair after the whole truckle bed situation in the Toral Palace. So this is my pad here. I nice have noticed artwork, flowers. just one issue. I do appear to have to walk through your cabin to go to the loo in the night. Okay, well, that's fine. So, so you this can expect is some visits and the shower. Quite bijou, but everything we need. There's a nice mirror there. Hello, everyone. Nice shower, actually. Through here, this is our seating area. This is um, slash Steph my bedroom. Stephanie's bed. This is our dining room. Slash office. Uh, then over here, we have toaster. Um, there we have a microwave. There's a kettle at the bottom. That's all I cared about. Spotted the kettle straight yeah. away. Coffee machine for you. Yeah. All of our little bits and pieces. Yeah. It's adorable, isn't it? And outside we have, yeah, our little oven. And we have a bicycle as well. 
Um, bicycle for two. I don't think that's going to get a lot of use, no. I'm going to be honest. And then if things get really out of hand, there's a horn here. <laughs> I don't think we can drive this. But Please just don't drive it. Let's just be clear, it is drivable by the looks of it, but I don't think you're meant to. But you never know what could happen. I could like sleep drive. Is it adorable? Yeah. I'm loving it. But we have to go. We have to go. Let's go. We're going to drive into central Lisbon. I'm not sure yet whether we're going to regret that and wish we had an Uber. But we're going to give it a try. It was all Stephanie's idea. What could possibly go wrong? We had to start our tour of Lisbon at the Tower of Belém, this iconic symbol not only of the city, but also of Portugal's age of discovery. And those of you who've watched our other videos so far from Portugal will know that we keep talking about neo manueline architecture in the palaces that we've seen. And this is the original manueline architecture that all of the future palaces keep referencing back to. Because it was here that King Manuel I decided to change the defences of Lisbon from a ship filled with cannons that used to constantly be moored here to protect from any attacks on the river to a permanent fortified tower. In 1515, construction started here and he wanted the architecture to reflect the glories of Portugal. King Manuel was rightly proud of the seafaring exploits of his nation and he wanted to show that off in his architectural styles. And therefore, there are a lot of ropes, there are a lot of chains, lots of seafaring motifs that make this style very different from the Gothic style that was all the rage in Northern Europe at the time. And if you think that it looks a little bit like an Indian palace, well, you'd be right, because Vasco da Gama had just discovered India. So again, they were using all of these influences that the Portuguese had seen around the world and showing how proud they were of their naval prowess. There is, however, amidst all of the ropes and the chains of this Manueline architecture, a little surprise, because carved on the outward-facing tower on the other side, is a little rhinoceros and no one quite knows why but it is the first rhinoceros in western european art and it might be linked to the fact that in 1515 the year that construction started on this tower king manuel the first actually gifted pope leo x a rhinoceros <laughs> why he did that i don't know maybe just to say hey look we keep traveling we keep getting really cool things from abroad have a rhino I don't know what Pope Leo X did with the rhino. I feel that this has raised more questions than it's answered. It's just a wonderful addition to a zoo. If anyone wants to gift me a rhinoceros, I'd be delighted to accept. But would Camilla be delighted? <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine, as long as it's cuddly. In our other video, we showed some of the neo manueline architecture, which is kind of fantasy architecture. This has the manueline elements of the ropes and so forth you can see behind me. But this is a serious fort. I mean, I'm looking at this thinking, this would be tricky to conquer, so I'm not going to try. Uh, okay. I am standing here on the sand and I've just walked across from Lisbon to the tower, but that wouldn't have been possible when it was first built because it was originally built on a little island in the river. And it was the huge earthquake of 1755 that we are going to see signs of throughout Lisbon. It was one of the worst earthquakes in recorded history. It destroyed so much, the destruction was so great that it actually changed the course of the river and then over time, bit by bit, the tower and the mainland joined together. So now it's no longer on an outcrop in the river, but it is part of the city of Lisbon. It's iconic, isn't it? Absolutely iconic. This building here is really symbolic of the age of exploration. No one is more famous with that than Vasco da Gama. He set off in 1497 and by 1498 he had discovered the sea route to India rather than having to take the dangerous and really lengthy road route. It was the longest sea voyage ever made by anyone in history up to that point. An incredible achievement but coming at great cost many ships and thousands of lives were lost in that process. The new sea route to India went around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa um, and from that the trading route started, bringing back silk, cotton, perfume, cinnamon, porcelain, wonderful, wonderful things which everyone in Europe wanted to buy. Those voyages were hugely profitable, however they were also dangerous, but many men decided to do it and this is why this town, this city, became so wealthy. 
Vasco da Gama arrived in Kerala in 1498 and the construction of this tower started only 17 years later, showing you just how important an influence his discoveries were. And this tower was also symbolic because with all of the other sea voyages that started from Lisbon after that date, the tower was the last sight of land that the sailors had as they just travelled into the unknown. And can you imagine how they would have felt seeing it on their return again? Yeah, it really was a massive gamble. Huge wealth if it went right, but fed to the fish if it didn't. I just can't believe how brave people were back then. Now you may think we're coming here to look more deeply at Manueline architecture, at the motifs of anchors, spheres and Templar crosses that can be found in those buildings. But we're not here for that. We're on a holy grail. A holy grail for Oliver, and he doesn't even know what that holy grail is. Completely not. But I can imagine. You can imagine? I can. I suspect it may not be do anything to do with stonework. It may not be anything to do with sculptures. Although I suspect it might be refining my own sculpture a little bit. Maybe rounding it out a little bit. <laughs> yes, definitely not any kind of diet. Okay. have come here on a pilgrimage, but not a pilgrimage to the monastery itself, but to a wonderful, wonderful thing that the monks created here over 300 years ago. Back in the heyday of these monasteries, the monks would be doing a great deal of laundry for all of the local area, and you couldn't buy handy bottles of spray starch back in those days, so egg whites were used to starch the clothes, which meant that the monks were left with vast quantities of egg yolks, which they didn't want to go to waste, so a lot of sweet treats were created. But the monks in this monastery took it one step further. They perfected the perfect egg custard, adding just a hint of cinnamon and encasing it in the flakiest, butteriest pastry. And the Portuguese egg custard tart, or pastéis nata, was born. Those of you who've been watching our videos so far on this Portuguese adventure will know that I think Oliver's favourite thing about all of Portugal is the egg custard tart. We punctuate our days with these delicious morsels. When we're walking from one site to another, we know that as soon as we arrive, we can just grab one of those delectable little bites to keep us going. So I had to bring Oliver to their birthplace. There are no monks creating pastéis de nata here anymore because in the Portuguese liberal revolution of 1820, the church institutions were abolished. The monks here had to start selling those custard tarts in order to keep some income coming in, but by 1834, the monastery was closed completely and they sold the recipe to a local pastry shop. They have kept that recipe a closely guarded secret ever since and they're just a three minute walk from the monastery and they're the only place in the country that is allowed to call their pastéis de nata, pastéis de Belém, which is where we are in Lisbon and we're going to go and try one now. Oh, I like the sound of this. <laughs> We've made it, Ollie, the home of the original pastéis de nata. Big moment, Oliver. Yeah. That's a lot of egg custard. Tons. 36. <laughs> They're all for me. No, 24 of them are coming to La Lalon for our guests this weekend. <laughs> I can't go home empty handed. What a lovely shop. I'm loving the tiles, Oliver. There's often quite a big queue to go inside to sit at the table or to go to the counter, but if you're happy with a takeaway, a little tip is to come round the side and there you can just pick up your pastéis de Belém and go off and have them in Lisbon whilst there's exploring. There's a park next door as well. There's a park we're going to go and explore now. So I'm eating all of these. I can't possibly walk. Once more, Oliver, you're not eating all 36 of the custard tarts. <laughs> no, well, we'll just I mean, no. Whoever holds them gets to eat them. So these rather splendid looking gentlemen are guarding the Palacio de Belém. This is the National Palace, which was the official residence where the kings used to live. And after the start of the Republic in the 20s, this was where the president has lived ever since. But I'm not taking you to that entrance to the palace. I'm taking you to the horse's entrance. Seems wrong. <laughs> we haven't been invited. Bit of a shame. They're lost, not us. 
<laughs> so we were even bringing the custard tarts. Yes. Oh, you would have given them to the president, would you? Oh, you know, to get an invitation. I suppose the residents of uh, La Lande. Oh. Uh, oh, is this him now? Oh, maybe not. You think he drives this little uh, Renault? <laughs> Yes, definitely. I wanted to bring you to the National Coach Museum. This is one of the most prominent collections of historic coaches in the world, and they're just beautiful, they really are. Now, this is where the royal family used to come and watch in this arena, the horses doing all sorts of tricks and things and shows put on for them. Now it houses these eight historic coaches. There are far more, but they have been moved to a new museum just down the road. But I wanted to bring you to this one because this historic building it's just absolutely stunning. I can't believe this was a riding ring. I know. All this over beauty. It. I know. All over it's decorated with horses. And now they've got all sorts of displays of some of the old um, saddles and so forth. And it would have been an incredible spectacle. It just defies belief how much wealth and splendour there was in this royal family in this quite small country. It's incredible, really. Even for the horses? Yes, even for the horses. It's really worth coming up to this balcony. The ceilings are magnificent. You don't realise when you're lower down just how intricate no. they are. Look at the little horses there. Yes, horses and then surrounded by Raphaelesque arabesques. Yes. Your favourite peacocks up there. Where's the peacock? Oh yes, 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 I see them. And over here, I love the head with the flowers coming out. It's absolutely stunning. It's magnificent. I have never seen anything like this in a riding arena. He's gobsmacking. You wouldn't know unless you came up on this balcony how incredible this scene is, you're right. Wait till we see the coaches. <laughs> I want to start with this one because I love the story. This was built for the marriage of the sister of the Queen. The Queen was Queen Maria I of Portugal. But her sister, also called Maria, so very confusing, but Maria Francesca, married her own nephew, Prince Jose. I don't know how happy she would have been about that while she was going to her marriage in this carriage. Not certain, maybe they got on super well. But well, what I do know is they didn't have any children. He sadly died of smallpox. But you might think that was the only little bit of uh, marrying nephews in the family. That is not the case because her sister, Queen Maria I was actually the first woman ever to inherit the throne in Portugal because she was the eldest of four sisters, all called Maria something. Mm. And her father obviously wanted his daughter to take the throne but was concerned that it might not work, she might not be able to, so he married her to his younger brother Pedro. <laughs> what a beautiful carriage though. It's a spectacular carriage, but if you look closely at the doors, I think that they're not all scenes of entirely happy love. No, that's very true. I'm not convinced that everyone is delighted about the loving embraces that they're in. There is a far happier wedding carriage here. Okay, where's that? I don't know whether the marriage itself was much happier, but the carriage certainly is. But this is actually a Spanish carriage, and it came all the way from Spain with Carlota Joaquina. She came to Portugal to marry Prince Juan, who later became King Juan VI. There in the front you can see the Portuguese and the Spanish coats of arms together to symbolise their marriage. Well, this one is really good. You've definitely got very much loved up couples here. Yeah, this is much better. Yeah. I mean, for a marriage carriage, I would go for this one. <laughs> you thinking about Stephanie? <laughs> Ooh, you first heard it here. <laughs> to make a bit of an entrance. There are a lot of coats of arms on the outside of these carriages. I think people wanted everybody to know who was inside, so it was the opposite of today's limos with like blacked out windows for <laughs> anonymity. Here you are announcing your arrival. And this, which I think is possibly the most spectacular carriage here, belonged to the brother of King Howell V. He was a duke, you can see his ducal crown and his Portuguese coat of arms. It's just the most spectacular carriage, and I like to think that's because it was French. Yeah. This is the best one, isn't it? It's absolutely amazing. We just need to take the dark pink silk and velvet hangings from the Cardinals, put them in here, and we have the perfect coach. But Oliver, I'm being quite weighed down with egg custard tarts at the moment. Which 36 of them, so actually, 36. Listen, just go and talk to the guy on the Avis desk and say which one we're going to get. It's French, Oliver. Oh. 
what an age. It does have the royal coat of arms of Portugal on it because it was ordered for the royal family, but it's French and it's a Berlin. They were the Rolls Royce back then. Queen Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI actually tried to escape in a Berlin, a bright yellow one. Just what Philip wears to greet you in the morning? Do you know what? If I offered him one of those outfits, he would absolutely wear it. He would love that. Are you a shire horse? As always, I'm not a shire horse. I'm a Shetland pony. <laughs> Even the spurs. Look, little griffin's heads. Oh. And then angels. I would have liked those ones best. Also, they're less spiky. So elegant. And which of the saddles? Would you like the uh, rather comfortable sort of hairy number? <laughs> no, I like these pink ones, what I ones? think, best. Are those peacocks? I don't know. No, that's a good one. Yes. Oh, look, even the top. Look, look here. That's it, it's like the peacock saddle. It's absolutely beautiful. And this is Queen Amelia who started this whole museum to save these incredible machines for future generations. Good one, Amelia. <laughs> Not entirely sure what these are, but I definitely have those to poke people with. They joust? Just, yeah, maybe. Just to give people a little prod. Yeah, I can't see you jousting, I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure you should take that up as a sport. I'm already surprised <laughs> you're taking up boxing. <laughs> Don't tell anyone that. Oh, look, shoulder pad action. Yes. This is basically your perfect museum. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to wear those. Bit of swords. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it, when you actually think about it, joking aside, it was just... Incredible pomp and circumstance, wasn't it? It really was. To go back in yeah. time just to be able to get a glimpse yeah. would be so wonderful. So this is the Torero de Pathé, and we're going to go there later. But you can see the little carriages. Look, this is where they're all in action. So this is our next yeah. stop, this huge yeah. square. So we can't just think of the carriages. We have to think of hundreds and hundreds of soldiers on horseback behind and so forth. And all the ladies wearing their fantastic dresses in front. Oliver, I haven't even sat down yet. Sorry. <laughs> so how do they compare to the ones that we've been having around the country? 
they're gorgeous. To be uh, fair, they've all been gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's differentiating masterpieces. It's very <laughs> tricky. But I'm having a sort of spiritual experience of maybe if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, I interrupted you. I'll just, mm. I'll just leave you to eat them. Mm. Whilst Ollie has a little moment over there by himself, I just wanted to let you all know that back in 2019, Bloomberg predicted that the pastel de nata was going to become as ubiquitous as the French croissant. So I think he's just trying to get in there first, actually. <laughs> How many have you had? No way. Absolutely not. I'm saving Lalonde from them. They're awful. <laughs> They're horrible. The British Guardian even said that it was one of the 50 best things to eat in the world. So when you come to Portugal, make sure to eat some of these. Mm. That just it's for me, it's not even the custard, it's the pastry. They are exquisitely good. Oliver, you're drawing attention to yourself now. Just take a look at this flaky, golden, buttery pastry filled with a lightly cinnamoned egg custard. This is the historic number 28 tram. <laughs> it is so cute. It's a little wow. bit crowded. That is full. Okay, it's gorgeous, but I'm quite glad we have to squeeze in there. That one's more like it. We've come into the centre and it is such a beautiful city. And incredibly vibrant. There are musicians everywhere, people sitting on the streets. And it's warm. It's wonderful. <laughs> I had to come to Vista Alegre. So the story of this for me is a year ago, or maybe six months ago, I was given a plate by my friend James Hartley. Hello, James. And um, it was a sort of housewarming gift. And it was lovely. And I looked at the brand and it was Vista Alegre, Portugal. So I had to come to this shop, of course. Been going since 1824 and it's an absolute sort of iconic brand for every Portuguese person when it comes to porcelain. Well, it's seared into my mind because since you got that plate, you have not stopped talking to me about Mr. Allegro. You are no, quite obsessed with them. This is on my them. Christmas present list for Camilla and everything. But look at them, it's absolutely stunning. I love this. Flowers. Oh, yes. Oh, it's this so is... delicate. Oh, he's off, he's off. What's well, he found? Is plate, this is the plate I was given. You are joking. No, <laughs> that's it. That's your plate? Yes, this is the one that I was given by given. James. Yeah. It is gorgeous. It's lovely, isn't it? And that set it off. So James, if I've been any more of this at any point, it's all your fault. And here we can hold a piece of Portuguese history because those of you who saw our vlog in the Pena Palace will know that the royal family there were also using Vista Alegre plates. They had that lovely botanical green set. So this is the Vista Alegre, is it yeah. really? Oh, it is. Oh delicate, fresh, light, and very based on nature, botanical themes, delightful. Everything is so cool. These are incredible. But I was distracted because here, we've got a Christian Lacroix collection for Vista Allegre. And I just remember loving all of his clothes back in the 80s and 90s. And look, they're just, just darling. Fidelity, tenderness, luxuriousness, and I love passion. Those. Feel espresso in the morning. Com cabelos cor de mel singela. Seu nome é Mabel. É uma menina cheia de vida. Se vamos para a praia, não esquece. Little insider's tip, 
which I heard from an insider, which is you can queue for hours and hours and hours to go up the lift. We just walk around the side streets for a little winding route, and then you can walk onto the platform for free. So anything to save two hours or two euros, whatever it is. And also you get to see this on the way. Yeah. And this is the Carmo Convent, or what remains of it. This is yet another building that was destroyed in the earthquake of 1755. But it's still standing. Well, to a degree, yes, but you can see it's got a few issues like no roof, <laughs> stuff like that. How incredible and extraordinary that they've kept it. Yeah. Standing like this in the centre of town. We can't really comprehend the magnitude of the earthquake that completely destroyed this city. Over a third of the inhabitants of the city were killed. And tens of thousands of people who were not killed by the earthquake itself were killed by the tsunami that it triggered. It devastated Lisbon. And they have left this. And here in the middle of town, we have a reminder of that moment, this shell of a building, letting us all feel how lucky we are today. Exactly. And it wasn't just Lisbon. The magnitude of the earthquake was so great that apparently 10,000 people were killed in Morocco as well. Just insane. The views up here are spectacular. Over in the distance, we can see maybe the birthplace of Lisbon. We can see St. George's Castle. There has been a human habitation up on that hill since at least the 8th century BC and defences on the hill since the 2nd century BC. It's been lived in by the Greeks, the Carthaginians, the Visigoths, the Moors most notably were here for hundreds of years and finally the castle fell in the great siege of Lisbon of 1147 when the Second Crusade sent knights to rid Portugal of the Moors. It was a pretty horrible siege. The Crusaders ran rampage through the city. They did allow people out as long as every single item that they owned was handed over to the crusaders and they even killed the christian bishop living in the city at the time after that huge victory and by the way the only notable victory in the pretty failed second crusade the portuguese nation became what it is today what a beautiful city it is i can't believe it i don't know lisbon and walking around i have fallen in love with it We'll definitely be back, won't we? 100%. One afternoon is not enough, Oliver. No. Isn't it amazing? Incredible. Here we are on the Praça de Comercio, which means commercial square. It's absolutely vast and beautiful at night. None of this would have existed before the earthquake in 1755. And after that, there was an enormous rebuilding program to create this, which has been even described as a masterpiece, can't it? It is beautiful. I wish we could see the sea. Okay, admit it, Ollie, I can see the lapping of the waves. Fair enough. There is water. There is definitely water. It does say no swimming though, so please stand back. Oh, well, honestly, you're such a spoil sport. <laughs> I was about to get in. No, it's been a beautifully warm day all day, but now I'm It's pretty cold, isn't cold. it? Yeah, I'm chilly. Shall we go and find a warming little food market? I think so. This rather splendid looking gentleman is Jose the First, who oversaw the works. And behind Jose, and by the way, it's a really good elephant. He is particularly adorable, actually and to mark the pinnacle of the rebuilding of Lisbon, which was a gargantuan effort. I mean, the city was virtually destroyed, is the Ark of the Rue Augusta over there. <laughs> Ollie and I have decided to sit down on the big square to start what will be a little bit of a food crawl discovery of Lisbon. But the reason we came to this restaurant is that I'd heard that they sold a recipe book that I very much wanted. This place is called Can the Can. 
the best in can. Those of you who saw our Porto vlog will know that we bought some tin sardines or pan sardines as some would say and canned fish generally is a huge Portuguese speciality and this recipe book is all about how to use tin sardines and other tinned fish and I was quite excited to have a recipe book to take back with my tins of sardines to try at La Lande but look how delicious this is this is their sardine bruschetta so we're just having a little snack. I'm having a dry martini, not particularly Portuguese, but making up for it with the tin bruschetta. So I knew about the recipe book and that's why we're here. What I didn't know about is what lies within this little paper bag. I'm, my mind is blown. I'm gonna show you what I bought. This is Garam. This is a name that I only know from learning about ancient Rome. When I was in Pompeii, I heard all about Garam. This was the most highly prized condiment in Roman times, and it was made with salted fish. They had huge salting vats. What I didn't realize is that the biggest of those industrial complexes for salting fish and creating Garam was in Portugal. And they have recently decided to try to remake garum because the original recipe has been lost. No one truly knows what garum originally tasted like, but they have used in the archaeological remains of the garum salting creation complex, they've used the old vats, they filled them with sardines, and they've created garum. To me, this is as mind blowing as if we sat down in a restaurant and they said, And would you like a dodo steak with your meal? This is a taste of history. So I'm taking it back because my mother is obsessed with the idea of garum and I'm pretty sure Maria is as well. Taking it back to La Lande for us to try. Wow. I know, and look, it's with a little pipette, a little dropper that's Do you think it's precious. very strong? I think it's very, very strong. I think it will be similar-ish maybe to Thai fish sauce. But uh, yeah, produced in the Roman ruins of Troia. Wow. Incredible. No longer have ketchup. Have no. garum. A little garum. I mean, that's the way we do it at La Lande. I don't know about you, Oliver. <laughs> My goodness. So, the people working here just overheard us talking about the garum and came and said, would we like to try all of their garums? Mackerel, red mullet, tuna, octopus garum, swordfish. I'm going to have to try this, sorry. Which sorry. is that one? The wreck, wreck fish and swordfish garum. Would you like some? A little on the side of my plate, please. Thank you very much. I'll try a bit of Should that. Try a little bit on my food. Yes, go for it with salt cod, which is creamy and delicious, by the way, everyone. Okay. I always order salt cod when I'm in Portugal. I always have a little bit of wreck fish and swordfish garret on my toast in the morning. <laughs> is it coming through? Mm, fishy, <laughs> in a good way. Okay, let's try this. Yeah. Mm. Good, bit of a punch. Mm. Do you like it? I love it. There we are, Isabel. All your Christmases have come at mm. once. Mummy, I'm bringing this home to you. It is intensely fishy, a bit like Thai fish sauce, but uh, less tangy, a little more, a little deeper. But they're all different, Oliver. Well, Isabel, I'm glad that Stephanie is bringing you back one garum. I have to say, if I was ever giving you a present, I'd bring you all of these. But you know, it's just my generous nature. And why aren't you getting Mummy a present? I think Mummy, Ollie's getting you all of these. <laughs> Thank you very much. They've just brought us some local vermouth to try, which is apparently flavoured with garum. Lusitanian vermouth. It's a fortified wine with fruit, spices, florals and garum. You're starting with the sardine. Sardine bruschetta. Why not? See, now we're going to know what to do with the sardines. Absolutely. And I'm starting with the salt cod. Well, cheers, Ollie. As you can see, I may have started mine. But yeah, cheers. To a great exploration of Lisbon when we only had one afternoon. So that's quite extraordinary. Yeah, I'll definitely be back. 
Ollie and I couldn't really decide what we wanted to eat tonight out of all of the amazing Portuguese specialities. So we've had our start of our sardines and our salt cod, and now we've come to the Time Out Market, because this market is huge and it's got lots of different food stores. So we don't need to make a decision, do we, Ollie? No, we just eat everything. Yes, all of it. All the Portuguese food in one <laughs> final blowout from the last night. Again, Camilla, I'm not saying anything, but I get the feeling I'm being led astray. Where to start? Well, I know exactly where to start. Custard tarts. <laughs> I'm actually joking. You've got this central area where everyone's eating, and then you can just go to all the little stores around the side, pick what you want. There's a big, big choice. Don't go crazy. Let's give you a quick tour. just you know any old stalls these are really proper chefs so every stall has this own description as to what it's about and these are people who are really passionate about food we basically decided to go for some portuguese comfort food miguel castro silva is the chef he's been here a long time in this market and we can't resist i'm going to go for a codfish brass style with julian potatoes and scrambled eggs and inspired by a visit to the porcelain shop Stephanie is going for a traditional cabbage soup. How could I not have cabbage tonight of all nights? Exactly. What else are you having with it? A little bit of a codfish croquette. I might treat myself to a cheeky cerveza as well. Yeah. I'm driving later, so I probably won't join you. Cabbage juice? I am going to be so skinny tomorrow. This really is comfort food, isn't it? Good. I can't believe we're ending the entire Portuguese extravaganza on cabbage soup, but it just Best feels right. I'm still happy with my cabbage soup, but Ollie's going in for the main course. Salt cod, potatoes. Is it good? The scrambled eggs. Oh! That's the thing that makes it perfect. Is it comforting? Are you comforted? I'm very comforted. So on the note of cabbage soup, it's good night from us in Portugal. See you next time. Bye everyone. Bon voyage. Thank you for joining us. Magara Maddox. Well, the ancient Romans were too. That's why it was worth a fortune back in those days. You are tasting ancient Rome right now. Pretty good.